Okay, welcome to the 88th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Morag Edwards. Morag has spent over 30 years as an educational psychologist and uses her knowledge of child development to shape fictional characters in both historical and contemporary fiction. She is the best-selling author of several books, including her recent biography uh, about her boarding school upbringing called Almost Boys, which we've got here, which is published under her pen name, Isabel Ross. Welcome, Morag. Thank you, Piers. Lovely to meet you. Mm, well, thank you for uh, agreeing to come and speak on the podcast. How I, I love to begin the podcast is just for you to share a little bit of your journey. How did you get into both writing, but also the educal, educational psychology? Okay, so um, as a child, I always liked to write and to read. Um, and it was one of the things at, at school, whether primary or secondary, writing was one of the things that I was good at. I wasn't good at much else, but I was always good at writing. Um, and so I did want to be a writer. Um, and so I went to university to do English and modern history. I went to St. Andrews University. Um, but I, I knew that writers, you know, just didn't make money. And I knew I would have to have a job, a job that paid a salary. Um, and also um, at university, I found myself really, really struggling with my course. Um, in, you know, my first year was a disaster. I barely passed um, with, with two resits. And um, so um, I took myself off to see the professor of psychology um, because I'd sat in on one psychology lecture, which I thought was just brilliant. You know, I just, you know, this is, this is me. This is where I want to be. Um, the summer before I went to university, I worked in a psychiatric hospital. And although I was pretty hopeless with the patients and, um, you know, I wouldn't say that I particularly understood anything that was happening there. I did realize that I was just fascinated by people's minds um, and I wanted to know more about what was going on. So I took myself off to see the professor of psychology and I said, I want to change my course. And he said, oh, yes, of course you can. Um, you can start next year with psychology. Um, so so that was, that was absolutely brilliant. So when I was in my third year, because Scottish universities are four year degrees. When I was in my third year, I was in a tutorial and um, our tutor said to us, you know, so what sort of psychologists do you want to be? And he ran through all the different careers in psychology. And, you know, I hadn't realized because I had an arts background and I thought psychologists must be medical. I hadn't realized that even with my arts background, I could be a psychologist. So he, um, I said that to him and, and when, when he'd finished laughing, he said, yes, you know, of course you can be a psychologist. You do need to do your further training afterwards. But yes, you know, uh, you can. So after that, once I graduated, it was about settling on, on what sort of psychology I wanted to do. Um, and then... Uh, starting the, the the very very long training to be an educational psychologist um, because you have in those days you had to be a teacher first and you had to have um, you had to have at least two years teaching experience um, plus you know I had married early and was busy having three children so I had to combine you know all of that um, with being a mother. And so I was a little bit late <clears throat> entering the profession. Um, and I, I just, you know, I, I, I found my feet in educational psychology. Um, obviously, the writing, the, the wanting to be a writer continued always in the background, but it just had to be fitted into the corners of my life. Um, and 
So although I always wrote, what I couldn't find the time to do, because it is very time consuming, is to get published. Um, to It's almost like a second career trying to get published. Um, it's hard work, it's time consuming. And so I actually didn't really start seriously with publication until I was fairly close to retirement. Um, I only retired a few back, but since then, um, I, I was published before I retired, but just with one book. But um, since I've retired, I've been able to actually treat it as a job and give the time to getting published and also the writing. And so I, I will have my um, fifth book coming out in um Wow, wonderful. In in May. So yeah. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And I, I've obviously been reading uh, your book the last couple of weeks and it's great. Thank the you. Way you brought in the psychology, the attachment theory, your own stories, and you know, I felt all types of emotions, you know, quite a lot of anger when you were talking mm -hmm. about I don't know fisherman and we'll come yeah. on to that later on but yeah i really yeah. recommend people to to read this because it's uh, yes. fascinating so I what did... drew you... sorry oh, sorry i was going to say what drew you to 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 writing about yes. your, yes. your experience once i left university obviously at st andrews there were huge numbers of people who'd been at boarding school because that's a sort of university it was and is um but uh after i left st andrews i didn't meet a single person who'd been to boarding school you know through my personal and my working life so boarding school kind of disappeared um but i knew that things weren't right in me um, and, and I'll talk more about that later, but I didn't make the link with boarding school. Not even through three years of psycho psychotherapy was that link ever made. And um, so I had these diaries that I'd carried with me, but I'd never thrown them away. And But if I flicked them open and had a look, all I felt was embarrassment and a degree of shame in the bit, little bits that I read. So I just pushed them away. And then at the beginning of lockdown, I sat down and read them through properly, word for word. And what jumped out at me was that, well, hang on, this is, this is, this is attachment. This is executive function. This is, and, and so on and so on. And I just thought, my goodness, it's all there. And you can bring the two together. You can bring your, all of your psychology background and your personal history together. Um, so I did the um, Curtis Brown creative memoir writing course through lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the first draft finished by the end of that course. And throughout also, I'd started reading the boarding school literature, absolutely soaking it up. Um, the personal stories, the academic books. I started listening to your podcast, newspaper articles, anything that I could find. And, and the penny really started to drop in terms of, of this is me. Um, but what I couldn't find in that literature, I found a lot that I could relate to but I didn't find a lot I could relate to as a girl at co-ed boarding, mm -hmm. um, particularly of my generation. And I just started to feel, I want this told. I want what happened to me told because I don't think people understand. Even people who are skilled, very knowledgeable in the field. I don't think they quite get it. And um, I often read in very good, well-meaning, well-researched books that about the horrors of all boys boarding schools. Mm. And then there would just be a throwaway line like, 
girls weren't admitted until such and such a date. Now that's a very innocent line, mm -hmm. but I found it made me angry mm -hmm. because I thought the subtext was, so that was okay then. Girls were admitted, so that was okay. So girls were being admitted for boys' education. They weren't being admitted for girls' education. Wow. They were there for the boys. They were there to make things better for the boys. And I think that for me, that summed up my school experience. And I wanted people to understand that a co-ed school, unless you are you truly understand girls' education and you're educating girls for girls, for their own, for their own success and well-being. Um, it's not enough just to put boys and girls together and think, well, everything will be all right. Mm. So Thanks. yeah, I, I wanted it out there. Yeah. So, because I obviously went to a co-educational boarding school myself, mm. I interviewed Amelia White, who I was yeah. at school with, and we talked about this. I'd love for you to share, because she said the same thing. It was a very patriarchal mm. society, and it was basically any feminine qualities are squashed. You know? mm. So I'd love you to maybe share what you feel is important for girls in their education that you know, wasn't happening in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s? Well, sadly, um, from the research I've done, even in state schools now, mm -hmm. uh, things aren't a lot better. Um, you know, it, it, there's so much evidence out there that, that it's not. Um, but I, I think one of the people I interviewed for my book she said she had a wonderful throwaway line. She said, she just, they just opened a boarding house and threw us in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that specific to my boarding school experience was that there were it's about 800 pupils in the school when I went, and half of them would have been day pupils. So there would have been um, 400 boarders. Um, of whom 40 were girls. Wow. So there was 40 girl boarders. There would have been a huge number of day girls. Um, but the pressures on us were huge. So we were rightly under the same academic pressures as the boys. Um, but there was a lot of pressure on us in terms of being special. You girls, you know, there was 40 of us in a school of 800. You girls are so lucky to be here. You are so privileged. And so the pressure on us to perform was exceptionally high. Um, at the same time as we were subjected to the culture of adolescent boys and and that's not their fault they were just being adolescent boys but the culture was misogynous and patriarchal but no one was monitoring the girls to ask a question is this working for them are they safe are they emotionally safe, which we weren't in that environment. And one of the things that became clear to me in writing it is that the boys, the boy boarders, you know, they, they, they liked us, they wanted to be with us, they particularly liked having sex with us, mm -hmm. but actually what they needed was because they were, boys who'd been abandoned by their mothers, mm -hmm. they needed caring and affection from us. Mm -hmm. And that's what made them angry mm -hmm. because they didn't get it. 
because we were also abandoned by our mothers. We were also incredibly stressed by the environment we were in. And so we were very frozen and limited emotionally, quite hard. And so they didn't get it from us. We couldn't give it. And nobody was giving it to us. And so I think that was the sort of key pressure on us. So as well as being academically outstanding, you also had to be really sexy and um, beautiful and, and friendly to the boys, to engage with them at every level, whether it was to be their girlfriend or whether it was to sew a button on their coat. Um, and also to deal with their trolling, their constant trolling about your sexuality or lack of it, but also about your academic prowess. Because one thing that had not, our boys hadn't been prepared for was to be competing with girls academically. Mm. So they didn't like it when the girls were better than them in lessons. And they would comment really nastily sometimes to you if you'd got a higher mark than them um, in lessons. Um, so, you know, that's that was the culture. Um, and I think that I, I do understand that girls nowadays, that not much has changed, sadly, but I think if you go home to your parents every night, that's the difference with boarding. Mm. Because a girl who goes home to her parents every night, she might have had a hard day with sexual bullying or taunting or, you know, the very worst that the internet can do these days. But at least they go home to parents or a parent mm. who love them and who will value them for themselves and who will provide different models of, of, of care and appreciation of them um, as girls. And certainly at my school, <clears throat> there was absolutely no understanding that the girls, yes, we were special because there was 40 of us in this environment. And were we doing okay? Were we coping? Was anybody checking our emotional well-being? Was anybody checking this boy we were hanging out with? Was he right for us? You know, were we safe? Um, and, and it was just that complete absence of parenting in an incredibly stressed environment. Mm, thank you. I was really touched reading your story and and, you know, as you speak there, it's like that neglect. I've just been doing some research this morning of the NSPCC talking about the four main characteristics of the neglect is emotional, physical, um, educational, and then healthcare. And as I read through, certainly the t top two, physical and the emotional, as I was reading your story, I was like, oh, wow, yeah. And I was yeah. reading David Niven's book last night and, he was the healthcare he had such poor food that he had boils yes yes you know and and so yeah i'm just um sh kind of i was sh yeah shocked to read your story so yeah uh, yeah I, I was just looking at something on the definition of abandonment <clears throat> mm -hmm. and right at the top is lack of supervision uh, uh, and and i think that that was you know so so characteristic of my school mm. um, which is is the one thing that I think stands out as slightly different from other boarding schools um, that I've read about um, our complete lack of supervision um, you know we, we weren't prisoners um, we were prisoners in the sense that you had to stick to rules mm. so if boarding house tea was at five you had to be back for five Bedtime was at nine, you had to be back for nine. But what you did the rest of the time, if it wasn't a school day, was entirely up to you. And no one would notice 
or care um, where you were and what you were doing. Um, and, and ordinary parents are just not like that. Mm. Um, and mm. so, uh, you know, a school is supposed to be in loco parentis, a boarding school, but somehow that had slipped their mind. Mm. <laughs> I can't uh, really like to talk to some of the teachers and because one or two of them are still alive. And just, you know, what did you, what did you really think? Mm. Um, because there was very much a separation between the boarding house and the school. And so, you know, in the boarding house, you had your house mistress, mistress and your matron. Mm. And one of the difficulties was, and probably still is, was to get women who were willing to do those roles so the only person they could get to be a house mistress was usually one of the teachers at the school, single woman, and they had to be allowed um, their weekends free. So they obviously, you know, Friday afternoon, they'd be gone from the boarding house, not back till Sunday night. And we were left 40 girls, maybe up to 50 sometimes, left in charge of, of one matron. Um, and after the matron I call Saggy, after she left, the matron we had was completely incompetent. Mm -hmm. um, and and but the girl, the up at school, you think, well, there's all these teachers. You know, why were the teachers not looking out for us? But clearly they didn't think that was their job. You know, they'd arrive at 8:30 in the morning, they'd be gone by four. Um, and they, I just don't think they believed that they had got any pastoral responsibility um, towards the boarding pupils, which it seems bizarre now. <clears throat> mm. um, but that's how it was. Yeah. Yeah, it feels that, as you share in your book, it shows that things haven't really changed. And I spoke to a head teacher a few years ago, and he says that nowadays that they have so much paperwork risk assessments um you know all of this stuff they don't have time for the children no no you know so what i see and this is where i'm kind of really doing a lot of research is around neglect you know them sh showing now i interviewed uh, professor david howe saying that neglect is even more damaging to the developing child than abuse mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is what i see in these institutions even now 50 or in your case 40 50 girls to one adult that mm. means wow. neglect yeah yeah absolutely mm. and that and, and and the incuriosity of our parents is another area of neglect mm. um they just didn't ask nor did they check um mm. and, and and that also i find puzzling mm. I mean, you spoke, spoke about that a few times that they just didn't believe you it's like mm. parents don't believe the children mm. Mm. you know or if it goes through a housemaster or a head teacher oh no it's such a children thing they're just making it up 30 yeah. 40 years later it's like no that's yeah. they weren't making it up no exactly exactly and th th there was a, a culture you know of disbelief and adults know best and and, and that was very much endemic in the 1960s um mm. it was the same I, in the 90s uh, 80s and 90s. yeah 90s 80s yes yes it doesn't change and 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 that's very sad mm -hmm. so one of the things i mean there's i've got lots of areas for those people who uh, uh can't see what i'm reading through but i'd love you to talk a little bit about how parents of boarding school children might be uncomfortable living with the child's emotions. Okay. You. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things that's um, very, well, there's three things. I'm going to go off here a little bit. Um, what underpins attachment? Attachment is the foundation, but what's the archaeology? What actually is attachment? And there are three core things. One of them is um, holding the child in mind or mentalization. Mm. That's the work of Peter Fonagy. 
And that's where the parent uh, treats a child as somebody with a mind and a child's thoughts and feelings count. And they do this for the child naturally. And as a result, the child learns to do it for themselves and then onto other people. So they learn that other people have minds like theirs and that other people's minds count. Um, second thing is containment. Um, and that starts with the repetitive routine of basic childcare. And because it happens repetitively um, and soothingly, um, the child is contained. And then that really big, big emotion, emotions. the parents, oh, I've got a bit of feedback there. Can you hear it? No. 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 Okay. Right. Um, so as the child gets older, the child has these huge emotions they can't manage. So the parents, um, they co-regulate, they will sit quietly, they will wait till the temper tantrum is down, and then they will maybe do the hugging and the soothing, and the child learns to self-soothe and how to manage these big emotions. So that's containment. And then, then the next thing is reciprocity, where the child learns to communicate and that can be non-verbally and verbally. Um, and there's somebody called Dan Worry who puts lovely videos on Twitter. And I just remember this one of this of the very young dad and he's sitting next to a baby who's only about 12 months. They're sitting side by side on the sofa. And dad is he's talking away to the baby and then he pauses and the baby's eye contact is constantly on the dad. He pauses, he waits for the baby to reply. And the baby does. You can't understand a single word, it's babble, but the baby's got the correct hand gestures and, and da, 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 da. And then so dad, he, he looks at the baby and he, oh, is that what you think? Right, okay, well actually what I think is this. And then he pauses and the baby starts in again. And, and that's reciprocity. It's not just about language, it's about communication, recognizing the serve and return of communication. So these three things underpin attachment. So there are parents who are developmentally young emotionally, and also they've not had, they've not had any of this for themselves or not enough. So when they become parents, they flounder with emotions. They may be fine with cooking a meal and getting it on the table. They may, the child may be clean, um, but when the child has big emotions, um, the parent may ignore them because they can't handle them, or they may get angry they may fly off the handle themselves because they can't manage it. And so what happens is that those parents that, you know, they, they really struggle with having a child. And so sending that child to boarding school, if you come from that culture, maybe, you know, a sort of, oh, well, you know, that, that let's just send them off because I can't manage this, I'm not very good at it. So as well as you've got families who for generations have sent a child to boarding school, so that's the next thing for their child. But you also get a lot of parents who are thinking to themselves, actually boarding school would be better for, for my child because you know I'm really not doing a very good job of that. I'm not, I'm not doing very well. I don't feel confident at this job. So that's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say that, that my parents, for example, uh, were probably emotionally, in every other respect, they were of their age, but I'd say emotionally, they were about three. Wow. You know, and they'd never gone beyond it because nobody had done it for them. So they're stuck. Mm -hmm. um, 
at, at that emotional level and they don't learn because they don't get the right sort of care and feedback even as adults and so you know incredibly um either dismissive mm -hmm. of a child's emotions you know you're lying you're imagining mm -hmm. um you know or don't be so silly you're making a big fuss or getting angry so either dismissive or angry um with a child's thoughts feelings and emotions mm, mm, mm. thank you thank you yeah there's quite a few things which stood out but this was one of the things it was like because i've been reading over again ambivalent attachments and uh, and powers papers mm. you know and I love what you say in the book that often our attachment starts before school. I'd love maybe oh, you yes. could share a little bit about that because some say that, you know, it's boarding school that it breaks the attachment, but often our attachment, um, whether it be avoidant or ambivalent, begins before. So I'd love you to. Oh, right. Yes. Yes. Tell me if I'm going on a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, no, for me, I'm fascinated by this. I'm, I, ooh, so I've, I've, talked, I've talked about the, the, the archaeology of attachment. So we're talking about um, holding in mind or mentalization. We're talking about containment. We're talking about reciprocity. That's the golden triangle. So, so let's talk about a secure attachment. So I don't know if you know this, Piers, but a baby is born with only about 50% of its brain. No, I didn't know that. And so all babies, when they're born, will have a midbrain, which is the mammalian brain, and they will have the reptilian brain, which is the very basic, for, I mean, essentially keeps you breathing. Um, and so we're born with such an undeveloped brain because if we were born with all of our functions intact, the head would be too big. Um, so we're born with half the brain. And the development of the upper cortex, the cerebral cortex. So the baby will be born with a smooth cortex, mm. just some basic crinkles in it. And the orbitofrontal cortex, cortex, which is here, mm. will be very, very under, undeveloped. Now, what we know is that the development of that part of the brain is relationship dependent. And so a parent who is doing the golden triangle well will actually build a social brain that is working and competent. And the first three years of life are when this happens or when it happens fast. And so by three, four years, this very fast building a brain will be starting to slow down. Um, and we can see the secure attachment very clearly by three, and we can see the anxious ambivalent, <clears throat> the anxious avoidant at three. Um, that's not to say that anything is fixed. I don't want to be an infant determinist mm -hmm. because the brain rem remains plastic all through life. Mm -hmm. So change and development is always possible. Um, and so it, it's really important to hang on to that. And also, there's a lot of psychologists who argue that a secure attachment is pretty well fixed and clear because that means you've got this really good social brain. Um, but if you're anxious, ambivalent, anxious, avoidant, you know, you you can you can change, you can develop, you know, very much with the right intervention and care which is all for, often provided by a very good nursery, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so 
And also a lot of parents will argue that their child goes between. So on one day, their child might seem very securely attached. And the next day, the child might be very clingy, uh, very upset, much more like an anxious, ambivalent child. So, you know, these things, we, we can't be too rigid about them. But, but what we can be pretty sure is that those ways of relating are there when a child, you know, at, at the worst possible age of seven goes to boarding school. So, so what happens then um, when a child goes to boarding school? And actually, Piers, we don't know. What we say happens is based on adult recollection mm. um, and adult interviews. Nobody has measured a boarding school child going and before they go do a lot of measures including an, an, an attachment interview and then measure it sort of like one week after arriving at boarding school six weeks so on and that research needs to be done mm -hmm. um, because the boarding schools claim you know oh it's, it's different now our children are happy they're secure well as in the same way as they provide evidence about exam results, I would say to them, well, where's your evidence? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think it's the boarding school interest to do this research, to pay for it. Because if they're saying their children are well adjusted and secure, I'd say, well, show me, show me the evidence, because otherwise I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. um, but from, from what we know about child development and from what we know about adult reflections this is what I think happens is that Bowlby says that when a child is abandoned they go through the protest and then despair and then detachment and Bowlby said that's very similar to grief in children and whatever your attachment style or profile when you enter boarding, you're a small child who's been abandoned by your parents and the reaction will be exactly the same. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what your attachment style is. You have been abandoned and you have lost all your hierarchy of attachments because what we know is that children have a hierarchy of attachments. And when you go to boarding school, you lose all of them. Whereas even a bereaved child, if they lose their parent, they have the other hierarchy members present, granny, childminder, mum or dad, you know, they've still got those, but a boarding school child loses them all overnight. So even if you're a securely attached child, you will have your massive protest, your despair, your detachment. Um, and what I think is that probably happens is that all the children go through that. They come out the other side, if we can put it that way, into detachment where they've given up. They focus on the present. Home has disappeared. They just go day to day. They manage, they box their feelings away. I think that's probably when the child's existing attachment style will kick in because the child is having to rapidly form new attachments and they will use what they had before. Mm -hmm. So your secure child, your securely attached child, because they're friendly, kind, thoughtful children that people like, mm -hmm they will start to make friends naturally. They can't help it, they have the skills, they've got a social brain that works. They will be friendly and polite to the matrons without being without sucking up. Mm. They'll be in class, they'll be enthusiastic, they'll get on with the work, you know. And so just gradually, they'll start to be liked and that's in a feedback loop they'll start to show their securely attached skills in, in the boarding environment. The child who I think 
is anxious ambivalent is the one that's most at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, they cannot thrive in a boarding school environment because everything about them doesn't work. The, 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 the drama side of it, the anxiety about friendships, the anger that's underneath. And I think those children, if they stay, they'll be the most unhappy and harmed. But I think what happens is that most of them will start to mask. They'll look around Mm -hmm. and they'll see that the anxious avoidant style is what works best here and they'll start to mask and they even might start to mask some of the secure child's behaviors and i think they are the what annie power describes as the the sort of um fake thrivers Mm -hmm. um the masking thrivers i would say i like the word masking Mm -hmm. because masking is so tiring if you talk to any autistic girl who has to mask all day it is exhausting and the anxiety doesn't go away in the anxious ambivalent child so you've got the exhaustion of masking and you've got the anxiety pattering along underneath all the time so then we come to the anxious avoidant child they will see that their style they're most comfortable with fits in well here. Mm -hmm. Other people are like me. And so they, although they will continue to be anxious underneath always, they will appear to fit in. They won't thrive, but they will appear to fit in. They won't come to the attention of of staff as a child who needs help or intervention because they're so independent and that's what a boarding school wants mm, um, settling in don't oh they've settled in well and, and settled in yes they've become avoidant <laughs> yes exactly now the question is now uh, sue gerhardt who who does so much work on the baby brain mm-hmm. she talks about attachment in older children and she talks about an unexpected change of circumstances and goodness me that's boarding school isn't it Mm -hmm. and what she says is that child a child may well add on a different attachment style so even a securely attached child might start to mask as avoidant if that if they feel because they're so socially astute they'll actually this works better here I won't show my enthusiasm here because it's not acceptable. So I'll mask that. Um, And a child who is perhaps um, anxious avoidant um, or uh, anxious ambivalent may also add a layer of a different attachment style. Um, But what she says is that that it's very easy if it's just a layer you've added it's so easy just to slip out of that when you're stressed you know back into perhaps a less a less useful um style in that environment Mm -hmm. so that's what i think probably happens i have absolutely no evidence i'm just basing it on my knowledge of theory, the books that have been written, the feedback from adult survivors, I hypothesize that this is what happens, but the research hasn't been done. Mm, so it sounds like it needs to be done. and Desperately. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always kind of reflect back to my boarding school experiences and I kind of try and think, you know, again, the figures, I, I'd say that one, uh, Nick Duffel calls it the crush, the complier, the rebel or the crushed. Mm. The crushed for me almost resonates with the ambivalent yes. attachment yes. because 
they're not yeah. able to regulate themselves no. they get bullied and more bullied until they turn avoidant yes i i think that i think that's true uh, unless they learn to mask mm. they will be the crushed um and i think little iona that i talk about in my mm. book she's one of the crushed mm. and sometimes they don't survive sometimes they need to to be taken home um mm. you know if if they if they cuz they're so bullied and and rejected mm. um and and then they feel that they've been you know they must always feel that they were rejected um not only were they abandoned in the first place by their parents but they they didn't even fit into this place that their parents had said was such a privilege and would be the making of them and they they fail at that so i mean you know how do you how do you cope with that mm. as you grow up yeah I, yeah it's it's interesting that I, I mentioned this in one of my last podcasts but uh, one of the guys on the year below me was uh, am, ambivalent attachment he was terribly bullied Mm -hmm. so much so for the first couple of years that eventually he left the school went mm -hmm. to another boarding school I think it was a very well known one at mm -hmm. boys only and he was so badly bullied there it was like a hundred times worse mm -hmm. that he came back to our school right and he right. stayed and yes. it's just yeah. like wow it's just in, in, incredible mm -hmm. um this so thank you that's brilliant I love <laughs> I you know I could talk about attachment theory all day so that's really well, interesting. I I think that in my book when I say that a child arrives at boarding school and they continue with the attachment style with which they arrived um unless it unless it's a secure child who decides to mask as an avoidant just to fit in. Mm -hmm. Um I I think that um I, I thought to myself, well, actually, that's a little bit of a just a sweep away line. You could have said so much more there, but you know, it merits a book in itself, well, doesn't it, does. it? Yeah, well, it does. It really does. It, it does. I mean, I found fascinating because I often hear from the schools they're saying, oh, the reason that the child is not successful is because they didn't have a very happy, you know, child existent before they went to boarding school and i love what annie power saying says that well actually the secure attachment often they show their emotions they get sometimes worse the bullying's worse but then they can't think that their parent is a bad person so the only option is to think that they're the bad person mm -hmm. that i'm there's something wrong with me mm -hmm. um in in that instance um so so I'd love for you to talk. I mean, you, I think it's page 28. You said about neglect. No one had responsibility for us apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, you know, because I'm really interested in the neglect side. I'd love you from mm -hmm. a educational psychologist, that sense of neglect and your mm -hmm. story around mm -hmm. it. Well, as I've, I've already said, you know, the, the neglect and the lack of supervision was extraordinary. Um, and certainly in that first, my first two terms, in the second term, I was in Rose Hill, which was the little girls boarding house my parents had been promised. What they weren't told was that it was closing and we were going to be amalgamated with the with the large girls boarding house, which had a um, horrendous, nasty, cruel matron. None of that was explained to my parents. But when Miss Kent died um, at the Easter, after I'd been there a term, that was my first, that, that second term in Rose Hill was when I experienced first the complete neglect was because they obviously, for one term, couldn't employ another matron. And the house mistress was, she was just absent. She was retiring at the end of the term, and we only ever saw her at meals. Other than that, she was just in her study, and, and she never came into the form room. She never spoke to any of us. So we were on our own. Um, so there were ladies from the village who came into 
clean and cook. But other than that, we were on our own. And, and that felt very, very strange um, to me as, as a, as an, I would have been 11 by then. Um, and, and really hard to cope with because Miss Kent had for all her being a, a very typical woman of her generation, she was fundamentally kind. Um, and, and she quite liked children, which was unusual compared to the other people I met um, in charge. And so she did actually, the three youngest girls, she did actually look after us. So we had a proper bath at bedtime um, with her and she'd, she would wash us and she'd wrap us in a towel and give us a kind of a, a sort of hug mm -hmm. when we were wrapped in the towel and things. So we were, we were used to being properly put to bed. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, it improved your sleep as well once yeah. you were getting that touch and that. It did, it did. And being in a biggish dormitory with girls of all ages as well um, was also helpful because they were, wouldn't say they were kind, but but they were interested and, um, uh, and you know, listening in to all their gossip and whispering and everything was, was very soothing at night. So I would sleep. Um, but no, we, we were just, um, you know, we were just left to our own devices. And and I, as I said in the book, my friend um, Moira and I, we used to just, after we'd had something to eat, we'd just zoom out on our bites and we found these older boys. We started hanging around with them. And, you know, although nothing particularly bad happened, um, it could have, mm -hmm. no one would have known. My parents would have been horrified if they knew if they'd known that that their 11 year old was out on her own with nobody knowing where she was hanging about with boys kissing older boys you know all of that you know that that wasn't what they were paying for mm -hmm. um and yes that was that was very very unsettling in in that first term mm. yeah, first year Thank you. And that was my first sign. That was the first indication of the um, of the neglect. And then, um, well, you know, it was just then characteristic of the rest of of the school. So, so if you were eleven and you had an eighteen year old boyfriend that you were spending hours and hours and hours with on your own up some glen or down in some forest or wherever because we were surrounded by countryside that we were absolutely free to roam. Nobody, no adult would notice or comment. Even if they noticed, they wouldn't comment or interfere. And then wow. as we, I mean, obviously when you are 14, you know, this feels good. Um, and so we, none of us wanted ever to go home because we were, um, we were feral, really, apart from mm -hmm. turning up for meals and for lessons. As long as you did that, kept your nose clean, um, you could do what you like. And, and isn't that the ambition of all 14-year-olds? But actually, it, it, it still makes you feel very uncomfortable, even when you're 14. You know, mm -hmm. you know it's not right, but you take advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was when you were 14, the incident was... Um fisherman yeah yeah happened. do you want to talk yeah. us through because again i just made me feel angry that yeah no adults stepping in and the no. whole school's turned against you yes talk yes us through that a bit yeah it was the second episode of bullying um so I, I i knew it immediately what it was and the awful feelings of shame of being bullied for a second time you know because it happened to anybody once but if it happens for a second second time then as a child you're pretty sure that it's it must be you you know there's something wrong about you and my parents were had paid all of this money to get me away from the first bullying incident at my primary school and um and I'd let them down by because you know here it was happening again you know all of their money hadn't worked. It hadn't made a difference. 
And, you know, I had little idea of, of why these senior boys started to um, exclude me, um, make fun of me, follow me. Um, and it spread down to the younger boys, um, luckily not to the girls. Um, and so even the boys in, in my own class started to um, do things like kick your chair from behind and things that all bullied children will recognize. Um, and this was coordinated and, and led by, I mean, he was a man because he was 18, but a, a young man and a very, very emotionally immature man um, who I call the fisherman in the book. And um, we, we didn't, I mean, I didn't really fully understand about coercive control until about 10 years ago. And I think we all know now, we all understand it. Mm. Um, and I realise now that that was, I was at the start of a coercive controlling relationship with the, with the bullying. And then he continued, he continued to control and manipulate me until I was his girlfriend. And I was his girlfriend for a few months and then he left and he continued to try and control and coerce me, you know, from university. Um, but, you know, that by then he had no power. Um, but but yes, it was it was a it was a horrible, horrible experience. And I was completely on my own because there's no way I could tell a teacher because we didn't trust the adults. And we didn't have any confidence that the adults would handle it in a way that would work, that would be positive. We also, the girls, you know, I say it quite clearly in the book, we didn't share anything personal because we didn't trust each other. The person who's really upset reading it is my sister, um, my older sister who was at the school and she was head girl. She was not just head girl of the house, but she was head girl of the school. Um, and, you know, she said to me, I, I, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you, why were you not able to tell me? And it's quite simple because she was head girl, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I, yes, she was my sister, but how could I tell the head girl what was happening? Because the prefects, the, the head boy and girl, were almost teachers and they would have, she would have been duty bound to report um, and, you know, goodness knows what would have happened after that if it had been reported. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. And this is this is the system is mm -hmm. that you don't speak up. I think George Orwell talks about that. Yeah. It was the unwritten rule that you never spoke up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was sexually abused at school. I never spoke up about it. No, you no. didn't do that. It was like that was no. the the worst thing ever to be a grass. Yes. And, yes, you know, yeah, and, and they don't they didn't listen anyhow when we did write letters or so they didn't believe us, they believed the teachers. Yes. Yes. Um, that's right. so, yeah. And 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 if you had um told somebody, um it, you know, probably it, it would have you know, you would have come off worse. That's what, you know, we can be pretty sure that's what would have happened. Oh, yeah. If you would have come off worse one way or another. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's just awful to be trapped in that environment. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that thing that I kind of wrote that in my book, this idea that I was bullied and I, I didn't speak up because it was like, well, yeah, the teacher leaves. You spend 95% mm. of your time with the other boys. Mm. If you break that rule, as soon as the teacher's gone, yes, you know, you might not get bullied by that person if they're expelled, but their friends will. Yes. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Yes, yeah. it will change your relationship dynamics forever. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to live three, maybe four years more in that school. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, you 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 know, as as a as a young child, particularly a boarding school child who hasn't had the who hasn't had the really good 
um, you know, that the, the magical trio that I'm talking about and is not good at expressing their feelings. And, and I mean, sometimes I think, you know, actually it was just even hard to find the words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I think I, I was touched by a few instances of other girls being bullied and then their parents came in and defended them. And, yeah, yeah. And when you are parenting and your child comes home, you can tell when they're not in a good space. And if mm. they stay in that, mm. you know, I'm sure this mother who came in and had a go at your your mm. class, mm. Mm. she probably picked up whether the daughter said anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's not happening in these institutions. The parents no. can't see what's happening. No, no. I mean, as you said, if you've got 40, 50 mm. girls or boys that you're looking after, how can you do the very close watching that needs to be done to see if somebody's a child's th not thriving or, or is worried? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned about the avoidant, the avoidance unlikely to put their head above the parapet. It's more like the ambivalent, in, certainly in my school, who got the attention yes. of the teachers. But the rest of us, it was like, oh, no. I'm all yes, right. yes. Keep because, one, yeah, one thing about an anxious um, avoidant child is that they will, they will never ask for help. Mm. And they don't like being offered help and will avoid it. Mm. Yeah, I stopped speaking. When I was 14, I stopped speaking for a year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, because it, I thought it's much easier this way. Um, much easier to stay silent. Yeah. 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 yeah because I, nobody's going to listen anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm, mm. So I was just, and I used to call myself boring. The older boys used to come up to me and go, Do you think you're boring? I was like, Yeah, I'm really boring. And they'd laugh, like laugh at me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And that's, or way that the bullied children often manage mm. is that they they take on the role themselves and they almost divert the bullies or amuse the bullies mm. by bullying themselves publicly yeah yeah fascinating i could go off on another 10 tangents here <laughs> so i'm aware we've been talking about an hour time does go very mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. Um, I didn't check beforehand how long you you had. So fine. my morning is clear. So clear. Well, should we say a, another ten minutes or so? Yeah, sure, sure. Are there? I mean, obviously, I sent through that list of questions. Is there something specific that I I, I brought up that you would love? You know, because we talked about di dissociation. Um corporal punishment this veneer of confidence so rarely offered the help i needed mm -hmm. i mean is this something in particular that you're really as you're writing this it's like right this is a key issue that more people need to know about i think that what what i think is key is that when somebody like me talks about my boarding school experience it's very um easy to say well that was such a long time ago or that's how things were then you know the boys at your school were behaving in a misogynist way because every man or boy had misogynist views at that time it's all historical it's all in the past um but I think in writing the book, um, I felt about that these things must still be current in boarding school situations. Um, because unfortunately, not a lot has changed for girls. And I think one of the things was that about vulnerable boys, um, Vulnerable boys are at risk. Um, vulnerable girls are too, but vulnerable boys are very at risk of 
finding their place, finding their home within the culture of extreme male um, Andrew Tate type mm. influence. And we know that children who go to boarding school very early are vulnerable. They, by definition, they're vulnerable because of what has happened to them. And so I think boarding schools, boarding prep schools need to be particularly aware mm -hmm. of the vulnerability of their pupils and to know about the impact of abandonment the breaking of all the child's hierarchy of attachments to know about trauma-informed practice because these are traumatized children there is no doubt about it and that is a responsibility of a boarding prep to work with their pupils as if they are traumatized and vulnerable children. And all the staff need the training, all the staff. Because as I mentioned, who the child turns to is not known beforehand. It might be the one of the kitchen staff or, or the groundsman or, or whatever, and all the staff need the training. Um, and then, so when you have boarding girls in a secondary boarding environment, you have to, the staff have to keep an extremely close watch on interpersonal relationships. Because if you've got boys who were traumatized boys at seven, so if they've been to boarding prep and there's been no intervention, then by the time they get to their secondary boarding, they will be traumatized adolescents. Mm. And we know that they will be much more likely to absorb the message online from extreme pornography and from extreme male influences. This is what we know. And so if you have girl boarders in a co-ed school, you can't obviously assume that, that girls are going to be victims of boy on girl coercive control, but you need to be watching for it and be prepared for sexual bullying and sexual harassment. And it doesn't have to be boy on girl, it can be girl on girl, and it can be boy on boy. But the schools need to be on high alert because none of those children can go home to parents who will provide them with a safety net and an alternative view of the world. And that's why I think children in modern boarding schools are at risk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I've expressed that very clearly, but everything that was a problem for me, I think, is a problem now still. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that if boarding schools are going to sell themselves as providing, you know, a well, well rounded education, I think they have to show that they are trauma informed mm -hmm. and that they know how to do relational work with their children. And it's not for individuals, it's part of the curriculum mm -hmm. of how to have safe, positive relationships with each other and with adults. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in the book, I quote 
um, it was an article by the journalist Olivia Petter, and she was at boarding school, you know, it's only about 10 years ago that she left. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the story she told in the newspaper, you know, could exactly have belonged to my time at school. Mm -hmm. It was so similar. And so I, unless boarding schools take this responsibility really seriously, they are caring for other people's children and they must do it to the highest standard even higher than good enough parents mm -hmm. if they're going to be selling something that's worth having and and, and again i said to you i'd like to, where's the evidence mm -hmm. that you're doing this yeah um so i think that our stories all of our stories mm -hmm. and the information that's been gathered from therapists who work with um boarding school survivors you know it's relevant now mm -hmm. and the lessons, the lessons need to be learned mm -hmm. yeah i feel it is so relevant now that i was just thinking in the last 20 years of prime ministers in this country i think only um theresa may and an another lady haven't been to boarding school mm -hmm. probably 23 out of the 24 years yeah has been a, a boarding school prime minister yeah and for me it's like it's so relevant now yeah yeah these people who are in charge have been through these institutions yes um, and yeah. I love what you say about trauma informed we're doing this documentary that's one of the things we'd like mm -hmm. to stipulate as a wish list is you know mandatory sexual reporting but also mm -hmm. trauma informed yes, yes. that Th these schools have to be and we'd also like to close early boarding certainly before 13 oh yes absolutely i think that it has to be as i said i think all young boarders are traumatized i don't think we can pretend anything else mm. and so it needs to be registered as an ace mm. an adverse childhood mm. experience and once it's registered as an ace, I think it, that we then have to move to having it banned. Yeah. Um, yeah. It has to be banned. Um, and then, then the debate is, well, what age is right? And, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, as a working psychologist, I met um, a lot of adolescent children who'd been abandoned within their own family. Um, abandonment happens. Um, it can happen physically in that you're abandoned at boarding school, or it can have happened within a family. Mm. Um, and I met children whose parents worked such ridiculous hours, worked in London from Leicester, would leave at seven in the morning, would come in at eight at night. Um, the child would not be fed. No one would speak to them. No one would ask about their homework. And so then you get alcohol problems. You get um, anorexia, depression, and so on. And so, you know, for some of those children, I would have thought weekly boarding from 13 or 14, as long as the parents commit to a family weekend, mm -hmm. may have been a better alternative than what those children were living through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The best outcome is the children aren't living through that, mm. yeah. you know, but they are. And so, you know, I don't know. Mm. I don't know when, yeah, certainly not before 13 or 14, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That my kind of, in my work, I feel 16. Yeah. Because 13 for me, uh, it's puberty. I needed the space. Yeah. I was yeah, in an open yeah. dorm with 30 boys. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I had a cupboard and that was it. And uh, just yeah, this old yeah. metal bed and, yes. and no privacy. And no. 16, you know, I've already developed my good enough attachment. I've kind of already yeah. got that strong self and therefore yeah. I can hold out. Whereas at 13, I, I, I couldn't. And no, it was interesting, no. I spoke to someone who's in his 20s last week who had a horrific time at boarding school mm, mm, yes. Bull bullied terribly yes yes and it's like mm, i just see it hasn't changed in no no exactly and it's also the time of the second 
reorganization of the brain mm -hmm. um, at 13, 14. Um, it's not as remarkable as the first three years, but it nevertheless happens. Mm -hmm. And is, is that a time where you want a child away from their family when their brain is, is going through the second reorganization? You know, it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I certainly settled for 16, for six form boarding, mm -hmm. perhaps, mm -hmm. preparation for university and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we had 16-year-olds at university at St Andrews. Really? Yeah, yeah. If you'd done your Scottish hires and you left school straight after you'd done your Scottish hires and you were young in your year, you could go to university at 16. Wow, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your thank time you. today, Morag. I've really thank enjoyed you. this conversation and I've still got another 20 questions left. Yeah, but, no, um, sorry about that. It, it will have to be wait for another time i'd recommend yeah. everyone to read uh morag's book i put it into the description so you can click on a link and uh buy it and then please do leave reviews for her because it's uh really great i love how you've you brought in your very personal stories and linking into attachment theory and psychology Thank so thanks very much pierce it's been lovely to meet you mm, a pleasure all right take care more thank you bye-bye bye-bye